This is Lynn Fraser. I'm here with Richard Miller, who's a psychologist, and he's going to introduce himself. And in particular, we're going to talk about how his work is at the root of recovery from addiction. Go ahead, Richard. So I'm delighted to be here with you today, Lynn, and I'm a special fan of Scott Killaby and all the work he's doing through his center. I'm the president of my organization, the Integrative Restoration Institute, and we've developed a program that is being utilized in actually addiction centers around the United States, but we're also coming into over 85 uh, VA sites in the United States, plus in Canada, Australia, England, and different places around the world. That's a lot of places. That's wonderful. It's, you know, it's been delightful to see how the work that we're doing, also the work that Scott's doing, is really taking off in a lot of different areas. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you train teachers to go in and work in these places. Obviously, you can't do all of that work yourself. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it is, the, the base of the program, and what are the key elements of it? Yeah. Uh, my institute is primarily a training institute, although over the years, what I've done is showcased how the work can uh, be effective with different populations and issues. So we've actually been doing research, hard research, in the areas of chemical dependency and addiction, but we've also done a lot of work with trauma, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety. We've done research in uh, issues around sleep and chronic pain, and also a lot of research around well-being. So I often will showcase the work with the population, say with people who are addicted to a particular chemical or particular behavior, or people experiencing post-traumatic stress or anxiety and showing the effectiveness both through the research and then actually coming into different centers. And then we train our teachers in how to then bring the protocol I've developed to these different populations and issues. That's a bit different than a lot of um, similar kinds of work in terms of you've got research backing up, showing that it works. You know, a long time ago, I realized without the research, we're not going to really drive my program or programs like mine forward. So the research is is really important to show that it actually works, how it might work, and with what populations. Can you talk a little bit about what it is that a teacher would do if they go into one of the VA centers? What would that look like? Yes. We have a a training program, a level one, a level two, and actually a certification program. So the military came to me in 2004 and asked if I would do a research project with uh, wounded warriors coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq who had severe post-traumatic stress. And we were able to show the effectiveness of our program so that they hired us at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in 2005 or six, so that any warrior coming through who was wounded could get access to our program. Subsequently, other VA sites picked us up, Miami, Chicago, Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. And we began to train our teachers to come into these different locations to work with veterans who were experiencing post-traumatic stress or chronic pain, or had become addicted to different substances as a result of self-medicating themselves. So we have designed a program that's manualized, uh, duplicatable, replicable, and and research-based. So it follows a particular 10-step program. So when my teachers come into a particular VA site or clinic or hospital, they basically teach this 10-step program over a period of time. So the groups tend to be ongoing, where people can come in at any time, but over, say, a 10 weeks uh, period, they'll get introduced to each of the segments of the program. And then they tend to keep coming back. And One of the things we found when we came, say, into the Washington, D.C. VA is we started with one group, then it filled, 
and the vets who were in it didn't want to drop out. So we started the second group and mm -hmm. then a third group and then a fourth group and then a fifth group. So they're very popular. So we've, we've had to add groups over time. Now I'm delighted to say the VA is sending their mental health staff into our trainings so that they can actually run the groups rather than bringing in, say, consultant teachers. They can bring in uh, the groups through their own organization, their own staff. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. And so can you give us a, a taste of what it would be like? You know, I obviously can't go into too much detail, but what are the general things that are covered in the 10 week program? Well, I like to say that every journey begins with an intention. So when we're coming into say our program, the first thing we ask people is, what is their intention for coming into the program? What would they like to leave behind and what would they like to take with them? And intentions to me have actually uh, three parts. So we develop uh, questions that help people really access these three components within themselves. The first is, what's their overall deepest, we call it heartfelt desire that they would like to actualize in this lifetime? So if we're, we're looking back over our lifetime, how would we like to say we've lived our life? What are the core principles we'd like to say we lived in our life? And, and core principles to me are things like authenticity, spontaneity, um, a sense of purpose, meaning, and value. So we're really helping a person bring out a, a deep sense of intention for how they'd like to live their life. And if they're needing to overcome some adversity that they're struggling with, if they had overcome that, how would they imagine their life being? So that's the first part. We call that the heartfelt desire. And actually, when we came into the military, the, the military said, you know, we don't do heartfelt desire, but we can do heartfelt mission. So we, <laughs> we asked them, so what's the mission that you feel life has sent you on? Mm -hmm. And the second part is, what are the small and large intentions that you would engage daily and over weeks or months or years that could help you actualize this particular heartfelt desire or mission for your life. So we're looking at little incremental steps that a person could take on a daily basis, building on success that helps them really actualize their life the way they think they would like to be living. The third part is we help a person locate within themselves a very deep grounded inner resource so that when they're in touch with it at a very deep bodily somatic level, they feel a sense of ground, stability, security, ease, peace. Because what we found as people are working through their life issues and different psychic material, memories, experiences, beliefs, negative emotions, as these are arising, uh, they can quickly get overwhelmed. So we want them to have an inner resource within them that they can keep coming back to that helps them stay grounded and feel like from this place they can meet any emotion, any belief, any memory that's arising. So we, we spend a lot of time with people really helping them develop and be able to access this quality of inner resource at an instant and how to take it into their daily life so that when they're out and about in the world, they're continuing to access it because life has stresses. And so we wanna be able to meet those stresses from that inner resource. So that's really the first component. So if I could just, just ask a question here. So um, lots of people go to war and are in the service who don't develop PTSD or PTSD post-traumatic stress, and some do. Is yes. this lack of an inner resource part of what's happening with people who do develop post-traumatic stress after that kind of experience? It's, a, it's an interesting, intriguing question, and a lot of research is being put into it. What 
primes a person for post-traumatic stress while another person is able to go through, as you say, these kinds of experiences and not come out and is able to have a, a kind of an inbuilt resiliency uh, mm -hmm. to stress. That's um, a question that has yet to be answered, but I would say there is a core piece that people who have a kind of an inbuilt ability to be resilient and to have an inner anchor of well-being, I would say, within them are able to navigate circumstances much better than someone who doesn't have those inner resources that were built into them when they were children, say. Right. Now we're getting into the whole area of childhood adverse experiences and the kind of, you know, complex. Yeah, we, I mean, we know that the research on early childhood experiences can have tremendous adverse or build resiliency into us. So right. people who've had trauma during childhood are more prone and to have addictive behaviors or to have post-traumatic stress or depression. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at this particular population, a lot of uh, PTSD, anxiety, depression, a lot of really, um, a lot of wounded elements in people coming back from war. Are you also seeing the connection around addiction? Is there a, is there a higher level of addiction in this? population as well? I know a lot of them are on prescribed medications as well. Yes, I would say so because when they come back with particular wounds or memories or experiences, there's a tendency to self-medicate. And we can do that through oversleeping or through alcohol or through prescription drugs. What we've found in a number of our studies is that people who say go through our program tend to use medications less, even go off their medications. And these could be anything from prescription pills for pain or anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress. But we've also found, interestingly, people who are diabetics, they'll often reduce their medications, stress, in the body causes a kind of a uh, an antidote to prescription so people who are under tremendous stress and they feel it internally tend to overuse or over need medication whereas as they reduce their stress within their system they tend to use less medication whether it's antidepressants anti-anxieties alcohol or interestingly enough diabetic medication yeah that is interesting wow Okay, so before I interrupted you, you were kind of finishing part one. So well, part one is what we call this intention. So small intentions that help us build success on a daily basis that helps us lead to this overall ability to feel that we're on track in our life. And this, this uh, embedded somatic felt sense of an inner resource that we can access at any time so that we can feel we can meet any adverse uh, moment in life with a sense of well-being and resiliency. So that's really the first component. The, the next two components, we call them body sensing and breath sensing. They're really designed to help a person gain access to their physical body and all the sensations that are inherent in the body. And this is really a critical component when we go through adverse experiences, there's a tendency for the body to get overwhelmed with the information that's coming in and to go basically numb as a defensive strategy. And we're all designed to do this if we are overwhelmed with too much information coming in from any kind of an experience. And so what we're trying to do is enliven and reawaken the sensitivity so we can access the body's inherent information. I like to think of every emotion, every thought, every sensation or experience we know because it has an impact in our body. We know it through sensation. So having access to sensation also gives us access to responses we can have to engage life, emotions, thoughts, beliefs, experiences 
in a way that we can move through them in a resilient and fully, uh, I would say, potent way so we can have a sense of resolution, both with our past as well as meeting the present so that at the end of each day, we feel like we met the day um, admirably, we might say. You can go to sleep at night restful. Many people are going to sleep at night taking experiences into their sleep that they haven't resolved. We're right. trying to meet each experience so there's a sense of resolution, so we sleep well, basically. So body and breath sensing are, are designed to reawaken the body's native intelligence. And then the next two components are dealing with how do we build skillful interventions to be able to meet our emotions and thoughts, images, memories in such a way that we can, I call it, metabolize and digest them so that we feel we're really responding to life in each moment rather than reacting. So we have a set of uh, six to nine skills. I, I like to think of it as the manual that we never got as children. <laughs> yeah, I never got a copy of that. <laughs> yeah. How do we deal with our emotions, our everyday thoughts, and adverse experiences in such a way that we really do feel a sense of inner resiliency? So we teach these different life skills. We call them meeting, greeting, being with, and responding proactively to emotions, thoughts, images that we're carrying from past or present experiences so that really we're developing these life skills that we can then carry with us for the rest of our life. So that's the next two components. And then we have an interesting component. We call it welcoming joy. We've found through our research that adverse experiences can limit our sense of inner joy. So we're tending to look outward for a sense of joy or happiness or well-being. What we're trying to do is help people locate a sense of well-being, joy, or happiness within themselves mm -hmm. so they're independent of outer circumstances, outer chemicals, outer experiences, that they're carrying within them an inner local sense of well-being from moment to moment to moment. <clears throat> You know, recently I was reflecting on the, say, the Constitution that puts together the United States that Jefferson wrote. And in it, he was very cagey. He said, we all have the right to pursue happiness, but we may not be able to find happiness in outer circumstances. What we've come to realize is through the research we as human beings are primed to constantly be searching for happiness or joy through outer circumstances. And as, an, as a human animal, we'll never be able to reach a sense of homeostasis or equanimity from the outside because the moment we get what we're searching for, it primes us to begin the search again. What we've come to the conclusion through our program and through research is we have an inner happiness, an inner core of well-being that is independent of outer circumstances. And if we can learn how to access that, we can have an internal stabilized sense of happiness, well-being, or joy that's independent of circumstances or relationships. So this component in our, in our program, we're trying to reawaken this in the people we work with. I think of it as a vestigial organ that has kind of gone to sleep in us, and the program is designed to reawaken this inner sense of joy and stabilized well-being. And then our final two components, one is we're teaching people how to have a sense of uh, perspective. We're easily caught up in our emotions or our circumstances and we learn how to have a, a an ability to have, take perspective in the moment the research we've done and i've investigated shows us and when people are under long-term and, and sometimes even short-term stress 
through, again, adverse experiences or just the daily stress of the phone ringing too much at work or relationships that are, that are having a difficult time, we can become hostage, held hostage by our emotions and our thoughts. And we actually see hard changes taking place in the brain where our limbic system, the, the part of our brain that uh, helps us navigate emotions can go out of whack, we might say, and enlarge so that when we're feeling, say, a sense of irritability or anger, we can actually get held hostage by it. And another part of our brain, the hippocampus, which helps us develop and have a sense of perspective, consequences of our actions, that actually we see it shrinking under stress. So two things are happening. One is we're being held hostage by our emotions and we're not being able to have the perspective of how to navigate them. So what we see is through programs like what we've developed, and this comes out of a lot of research on meditation, interestingly, we can actually shrink those parts of the brain that have become overactive and bring them back to their normal functioning so we're no longer held hostage by our emotions. And we can actually grow and expand and thicken those parts of our neocortex and limbic system that help us develop perspective. So over time, what we see people reporting is that they may still have the same emotions, but they're responding now to them in very different ways than they have that sense of perspective. As one of our uh, uh, students said, I feel like now I'm almost like I'm in a helicopter looking down at my experiences and I can see the consequences of the actions that I was about to take and refrain from them and instead engage more positive and healthy uh, um, responses to, to life. So we're really helping people develop this sense of perspective. And then while we're learning these, say, in the program, in class, both in individual sessions and in group, then our final component is how do we take these out into our daily life kick the tires, so to speak, take them for drives, so that we're really seeing them in action and how to put them into action in our daily relationships, in our job, workplace, in our families, children, among our friends, so that we really have these different life skills. We're able to have that inner resource of resiliency. We're able to respond to our emotions and thoughts in healthy manners and have an ongoing inner sense of joy, whether life is going you know, fine or when life goes not so fine, we still feel this inner sense of resiliency and well-being. So that sounds wonderful. <laughs> I have a couple things I'd like you to go a little bit deeper into. Absolutely. One is people, because it's stored trauma is the energy that we're trying to avoid. How is it that you create that safety for people so they can go in and be present in their body? And you mentioned body sensing and breath sensing. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. There's a core principle that I've come to understand about myself and ourselves as human beings. There's a core principle, I call it, being that we all know but we lose touch with because of the way we might have been brought up in our families our culture or through our life experiences and what i try to do as quickly as i can with anybody that i'm working with or in our initial groups when people come in we want to help them be able to access this what we call an inner resource of being that helps them understand that within themselves is this quality of well-being that has never been hurt, never been harmed, doesn't need fixing or changing, so that a person really comes to feel within themselves, not just intellectually, but actually at a very deep body sense, that something about them is fundamentally okay then we can look at what is in the body or the mind or experiences that does need changing, fixing, helping. But then we've separated out, I'm okay, 
but my body and my mind may need help and fixing and addressing. And when I do this with the people that I'm working with, fundamentally, what they often say from the very beginning is, I feel like I've just come home to myself. I've been in so many groups with veterans, with people in addiction centers, where when I've given them this experience, they actually do say, I feel like I just came home. And they begin to feel this sense within themselves of something that truly wasn't ever harmed, no matter the experience they went through. And as they access that and really bring it out and feed it on a daily basis, they're really carrying now with them what I call an unbreakable inner resource of well-being. Our whole program is based around this one principle. Call it sense of presence, well-being, being. I actually interview people so that they can discover the, the word that most represents it for themselves. And people come up with words like, I feel a quality of inner peace now within myself or a sense of well-being, a sense of ease, uh, so that they really do come back into touch with this unbreakable sense within themselves and learning how to nourish it. Pragmatically, I realize this can take time, but what I've noticed is most people very quickly can have a taste of it. And I think this is really important. For instance, I was working a couple of years ago with a, a person, a fellow who was severely, severely depressed from childhood and experiences that he had gone through. And he had been through many treatment programs, a number of psychiatrists, a number of medications, and still was very depressed when he came to me. So my initial session with him, I said, would you be willing to try something? And he said, sure. And I took them through this, it's a five-step process. It took to take 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And he was able to access this inner core of being or presence and really begin to feel something that had never truly been broken or harmed by the experiences he had gone through. What was interesting to me was he came back for the second session a week later, and he said, I, I want you to know that when I left your office, that feeling, that inner resource of being and well-being quickly faded, but it, what it left in me was a feeling of hope, that there was a possibility of healing here. So what we did is in every session over the next year and a half that I worked with him, we began this way and we would nourish it all through each session. And slowly he began to build that as a consistency of an inner resource he began to carry with him all day long. And so he was, as one of our veterans said, relating to something within him that didn't need healing or fixing or changing the basic okayness within himself. So then he was able from that kind of foundation to work with that which did need healing. And over a, a year and a half, he was able, I'm very lovely to say, to successfully resolve the depression, face mm -hmm. the issues that had been unresolved. And now I know him for the last three years since we worked together, he's out in life, successful in his job and relationships and children and, and doing really well. It, it reminded me of this one vet who said, every program that I've been in for healing has always started with what's wrong with me and emphasized what's wrong and needs to be fixing. You're the first program that showed me what was right about me. And he went on to say, why would I want to face my worst nightmares from a place that something's wrong with me and broken Whereas if I know this that's right about me, I'm okay facing these nightmares and willing to do the work that I re now realize I need to do. And I think this is why I so highly love, say, the Killaby program, because what I've seen in Scott's work and the work that's being done at the Killaby, it's oriented around the same quality of principle. There's a, 
a presence within us that sometimes can get educated out of us and it can get relegated so deeply into the background we lose touch with it. But programs like the Killaby Center and the program that I'm doing is we're trying to bring that foreground as quickly as we can and then build any intervention that we do off of that deep sense of resiliency and well-being. So I like to say then we're not healing to get to wholeness. We're actually healing from our wholeness, from something that's never been broken, can't be broken, can't be harmed, doesn't need healing. So we have that sense of wholeness right from the beginning, which we're building and increasing so that we're healing from that, not, not to get to that. So that's the core principle in our program. That I feel strongly that everyone has within them this core sense of wholeness. Our job is to help them access it as quickly as possible and then build the life skills that we may not have gotten or that have been damaged as we've gone through certain expense experiences and reestablish them so that we have both that sense of core well-being and these skillful interventions that give us a sense that now we can meet any moment, any experience, because we know what, what to do. You probably didn't learn that in your Western psychology training. <laughs> do you want to you talk know, a little bit about I that? I did not. And I <laughs> feel so very fortunate that when I graduated from college and I looked for a mentor, I, I began volunteering here in the Bay Area in San Francisco at a place called Fort Help. It was back in 1971, and it was a center for solving special social and health programs. And it was actually, I think, the first methadone maintenance program for people going through addiction and heroin uh, addiction healing. And while I was volunteering, I was looking for a mentor and there was a person who had just arrived from the Far East and she took me under her wing. And so from the very beginning, she actually was introducing me to this core sense of well-being, helping me learn to access it within myself and then in each person we worked with, how to access it from within themselves. So I feel fortunate that my mentoring into my work as a psychologist at the very beginning was actually rooted in these core principles. Later on, when I went back to school for my master's and my PhD, I actually felt sorry for my fellow students because they had never gotten this in their training. And they were coming more from an ego-based, there's something wrong that needs to be fixed about the individual. And I was coming from a very different perspective. No, there's nothing wrong with the person. There may be something that needs to be worked with with the body and the mind, but they're basically okay. I, I like to tell the people that I'm training and when I'm working with, if you can really access this, then wherever you are, when somebody asks you, so how are you doing? The only answer you can truly give them is, I'm doing fine but my body and my mind may be having a hard time. So we're really separating out what's going on with the body and the mind and what's going on with the core as, uh, the core essence of ourself. And we're, we're relating to the world from that core essence. So this may be a big, um, a big order, but is it possible for you to give people listening five or 10 minute kind of a glimpse of this, because we're talking about a sense that a lot of people don't have experience with or don't have access to. Absolutely. So if, as you're listening, if you could take a moment with your eyes open or closed, and first just to have a sense of opening your senses so that you're aware of the environment around you, perhaps a sense of the touch of air on your skin and sensations of warmth or coolness. And also 
a sense of the chair or the ground that's supporting you, where your body touches the surface that it's resting upon. Also be aware of different sounds around you, but also the sounds that may be more localized inside your body that you may be aware of. And if you let your attention just briefly land inside your body and notice any particular tensions or sensations that are calling your attention, say in your jaw, around your eyes or forehead, shoulders, perhaps sense the natural weight of your arms and just have a, a general sense of your whole body. And then I'd like you to, as best you can in this moment, access a, a simple sense of simply being. This is the experience we all have when say we're between tasks, we've finished one task like mowing the lawn or doing some piece of work, and we're not ready to go on to the next task or thing. So we're just taking a momentary time out. So the, to the degree that you can, take a moment of time out, just resting back, it's kind of like we're trying to find this gap between two tasks, two thoughts, two breaths, where we're simply being. And I've got five simple questions I'd like to ask. And I'm inviting you to answer them, not from your book learning or your intellectual mind, but actually from your firsthand experience. So the, the first question is, when you're simply being, you're not engaging any particular doing, you're just being, where and how do you feel this quality in your body? Where would you say when you're being, as being, you would answer the question, where are you? Where's the location of being? So many people say, I feel it in my belly or my heart or somewhere in my torso, a sense of being or well-being, sense of peace or ease. So the de degree that you can, just take a moment and feel this quality of being in your torso somewhere. And notice that the felt sense of being has both a localized feeling to it, it's kind of a quality of presence in the body. But especially when our eyes are closed, if we begin to feel for its outermost border or boundary, we begin to feel how it's more akin to a field of sensation that spreads out non-locally beyond the confines of the skin. So as one person in a homeless shelter said when she was engaging this question as being, she said, I feel myself as a presence that's both local here, but everywhere. I feel myself everywhere and nowhere specific, and yet as an undeniable sense of presence. So just take a moment, feel that quality of I'm everywhere and nowhere specific, and yet I feel myself as an undeniable presence of being. The, the second inquiry becomes as being, when you're simply being, what's happening to your thinking mind? And most people will start to say, well, I feel like my thinking is slowing down and I'm more falling down more into my heart or my torso, my belly. 
And they also notice as they're being, they lose a sense of past, future, even present. They're stepping out of time when we're just being. The third question is, as being, does being lack or need for anything? Or can you feel something about your basic presence of being that's beyond lack, doesn't need or want for anything? So that you could still feel how the body needs air and food and shelter and safety and clothing, but something about our basic core presence of being is outside of a sense of lack, need or want. So just take a moment and feel something about yourself that's outside of lack, doesn't need or want for anything. The fourth inquiry or question is, as being, is this unfamiliar? Or can you feel how being, the sense of presence, this core feeling of being, is something that we've known all our lives but may have forgotten or we don't tend to nourish it? But as being, it, it has a quality we've known all our lives, and so we're nourishing it more into the foreground. And the fifth question or inquiry is, as being, does being need a special circumstance? Or, or could you imagine, while you're being here, you could likewise have your eyes open or closed and still have a sense of being. You could be eating or engaging in conversation or even walking or working and still have an underlying felt sense of being. So what we're doing here is we're introducing something that we're all familiar with, but we may not spend a lot of time nourishing or have nourished in the past. Something that's familiar doesn't need a special circumstance, so we could be feeling it wherever and however we are, is outside of lack, need, or want. So there's something about us that's already okay, doesn't need healing, and that in a manner of speaking is outside of time and helps us drop from our intellectual thinking mind more down into our heartfelt mind. And it's something that introduces us to a quality of both localized and non-localized presence. We feel ourselves both here and also we might say spacious. So as much as you can, keep nourishing this feeling of well-being or being and notice their core qualities as we settle into being that people actually report and we can see this when we put people into an MRI, parts of their brain actually activating when they're accessing the sense of core well-being. And they report, they no longer feel so disconnected, they feel more connected to themselves and more connected to the world around them. So we find being nourishes a sense of both inner and outer connectedness. And we know that stress and post-traumatic stress, depression, disconnects us from ourself and the world around us. So nourishing being helps us reestablish this inner resource or inner sense of interconnectedness, but also a sense of connected, connection with the world around us, which actually can nourish an inner sense of value, meaning, and purpose that's independent of what we're doing on the external world. And we see this in research. People who nourish over time a feeling of being actually report an inner sense of value, meaning, and purpose independent of what they're doing or how they're being in the outer world. But also this core sense of being nourishes into the body uh, a quality of ability to access, interestingly, insight. When we're only in our intellectual mind, 
we're relegated to meeting the present moment from our past conditioning. When we fall into this sense of being, interestingly enough, and MRI research shows this out, we're able to access insight that's independent of our past conditioning. We can actually find new ways of responding when we're accessing being that we can't otherwise when we're just caught in our prior conditioning, which is more of a, in our intellectual mind. So we're, we're opening access as being to core places within ourselves that really do know how to meet the moment in a healthy, responsive manner. And we see these parts of our brain and our nervous system actually growing and thickening over time the more we nourish the felt sense of being. The other quality we see that as people settle into being, we ask them to report other qualities that they begin to experience. They'll, they'll talk about feeling a deeper sense of love, well-being, equanimity or peacefulness. And they're able to access core elements of compassion and kindness, both towards themselves and the people around them. So in a, in a very simple manner, this is this core access of being and well-being that I'm trying to introduce people to as quickly as I can. And while I'm doing it very quickly here with, with you in our time together, when I'm with an individual or in a group, we'll take 20, 30, 40 minutes, an hour, and really nourish these in to help people really kickstart them within themselves. And then each time we're together, keep nourishing it. And I provide people with MP3 and CD recordings where they can listen to it over and over again to help establish this core sense of being. And, and actually, I'd invite our listeners to access on my website, there's a free download where they can access a, an actual recording that helps them in, inquire into these five questions and help them locate this sense of well being and nourish it within themselves. And if we can access this, what we then do is we want to weave it through whatever else we're experiencing. So we actually create a, I, I call it a biofeedback mechanism. Whenever we're experiencing a good feeling, we weave this inner resource into it of well-being and being. When we're experiencing what's called a destructive or a negative feeling or emotion or circumstance, memory, we also weave it in. What we want is in the future, when we're starting to feel some negative feeling within ourselves or some reactive uh, reaction within ourselves, it automatically pulls foreground this feeling of well-being. So we're no longer having to think about it or access it through memory. We're actually feeling it in the body and it's accessing itself. And I'll give the example of one vet who had tremendous road rage through his PTSD and experiences. And he was constantly engaging in fights with people and he felt himself totally held hostage by his anger and his resentments from all the experiences he had lived through. He said he, he reported that he had just recently been in his car and he had been cut off by another car. And his whole past response of wanting to follow that person into a parking lot and pull him out of his car and beat him up was still happening but his hands were moving his steering wheel in the opposite direction. And he said that's when he realized this core resource of well-being was actually working. Mm -hmm. He wasn't having to think about it. The anger that he was feeling, which he was still accessing through his you know, rage, was actually pulling up a feeling of well-being that was turning him in a new direction. And he said he followed that new direction. And instead of going into the parking lot and engaging the old behavior, mm -hmm. he was now engaging the new behavior. And it short-circuited his anger and his irritability. And he was able to break that sense of being held hostage and see the consequences and go into a new behavior. So yeah. this being, it's simple, but very effective when we're able to, to weave it into our daily life. I could see how that would really come into play with addiction too. 
So you have a craving, there's something going on you want to get away from, some craving comes up. And then precisely, and this is what we found in the research we did with chemical dependency. We took a group in New York, 18 people who were uh, going through chemical uh, dependency. Um, and we gave them this intervention to see how would it help them with their resiliency and their ability to not go back into their behaviors. And, and we found, interestingly enough, that they couldn't relate to a sense of inner safety, but they could find a, an inner resource of security that we built with them in this sense of being and well-being. And it gave them a renewed sense of the ability to meet the desires that would otherwise captivate them and move them in a, in a destructive direction. And they were able to meet it more from this sense of resiliency that helped them see perspective and then look at a new behavior in the moment that wasn't reactive, but we call it responsive to the moment and build in a, a deeper sense of resiliency so that they didn't slide back into their old prior behaviors. Yeah, as I'm listening to you talk, it, it strikes me how different your career is compared to probably what you thought it would be at the beginning. And you know, most psychologists go into clinical practice and, and, and do wonderful work often. Mm -hmm. the, the work that you're doing is, is so broad based and it has at its root what really is the root of, of solving the whole issue around addiction. Because we don't need to escape if we have that feeling of well-being inside. No, and you know, when I began this work, my original mentor helped me face my own reactive tendencies, helped me access this core sense of well-being. And, you know, my own desire from the beginning, say my own heartfelt desire was to how do I bring an end to my own suffering, my own tendencies that are reactive and don't serve me? He was able to not just help me see this unbreakable resource of being, but also to help me discover these tools with which to meet the moment and know how to navigate the moment, and then in turn, how to share these with others. So uh, interestingly, I got the whole shebang right from the beginning for myself and learning how to bring these skills to other people as well. And you're right. I, while it was what I wanted, I certainly didn't know how I would get it. And I got it right from the very beginning. So I, I feel very grateful for how life has brought that to my table and then how I may, may have been able to bring this to others. So Richard, what is a quote or a saying that's meaningful to you in your work? Something that you've come across from someone else or something that you've, you've developed as a, as a core? There's a core quote that my staff has taken out of many things that I've said and kind of assembled it as a, a, as a kind of a core quote. And it's, it's this, it's, we realize how simple life is when we're able to accept this moment and realize we all have within us an innate and perfect response to this moment, just as it is, so that we're able to not pretend to be other than we, who we are. We're really learning and able to be authentic, spontaneous individuals, and that we really do have within ourselves a perfect response to each moment that feels in harmony both with ourselves and in what, with life itself. Mm, wonderful. And then we just have to do whatever we need to do to access that. And a lot of it is, you know, with the program, you've got, you know, getting people into the body, the perspective, the witness, all of those things would help to remove the barriers to knowing that. Right. Yes. Um, we, you know, we know that stress and life itself can really knock us off kilter and we can lose a sense of resiliency. We can lose a sense of well-being. Programs like I've designed, Killaby Center, we're really trying to help people access that inner sense of core well-being, resiliency, 
and to really discover or, or rediscover, I would say, because I think it's within all of us, that we all know what to do in the moment. That when we engage it, we feel both in harmony with ourselves, and we would say we feel our place in harmony with the universe. And I'm convinced we all have that within us. Our life experiences may have taught us to go away from that. Good programs, I think, that work well are helping people restore this sense of ability to respond, not react, and to really feel that deep sense of harmony with self and other. Mm -hmm. And that is a process that, that matures over time. It's not a, a 30 day treatment center necessarily. It's something that is, is very deep, very authentic, and it doesn't happen overnight necessarily. It doesn't. And while we got a program that we can showcase in several weeks or in a 10 step ability, what we're trying to do if we're successful is we've engaged a person's curiosity and interest and desire so that they're willing to keep going with it. And it does take time. It's a, I, I feel like we're teaching life skills and to put them in place for the rest of our life and that we can continue to hone them, develop them and discover deeper aspects about them for the rest of our lives. But, uh, this is a program for life. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when people get a sense, a taste of that freedom and that authenticity, the connection within, then that's what enables us to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is something we all deserve and have the right to as human beings. There, there's a core place within us that can truly feel in harmony with ourself, with the world around us. And that we all have within us a sense of a value, meaning, and purpose just in our being human, it's independent of what we're doing. And to help people really discover and access that, I think is so vital and so important so that we can really navigate the experiences we're all going to go through in life. And we're all going to get a slice of life that isn't always fun and isn't isn't satisfying and so that we're able to meet them and, and be able to have that sense of well-being no matter where we are no matter what we're struggling with mm -hmm. when i first uh, was introduced to meditation 25 years ago the thing that really caught my attention was the concept of basic goodness yeah. and it just i went wow i've never even considered that mm -hmm. <laughs> and then over time was able to discover that myself yeah and our family our culture it can really in, not nourish this and in a way put it relegated into the depths of our unconscious and our background so we don't experience it but as you're saying there is a basic quality of goodness within all of us and we're really working hard to bring this back to the foreground of our experience and not just as a lovely intellectual concept, but as actually our day-to-day -day experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting as research has discovered, we as human beings, we're in a constant search for happiness. We're primed to do that as human beings. We're constantly seeking after something that's gonna fulfill us. And interestingly, the research shows there are parts of our brain that as we're searching for that element that's going to make us happy, and it could be a, a new job, a new car, but it could also be for the gambler, a score in the, in the casino, for the person who's after heroin, the next fix, for the next alcohol, drug, or whatever. We're all primed to find something that's going to satisfy that sense of desire and happiness. Interestingly, what research shows is it's the desire and the seeking that actually is causing the brain to be stimulated with chemicals. But once we get the, the thing that we're looking for, the brain kind of turns off and creates a sense of dissatisfaction now and 
we're back in the search again for the for the next thing that's going to bring that sense of happiness. So research basically shows we're never going to be happy if we're looking for satisfaction in external values. We're always going to be primed to be dissatisfied. So that's and a natural I, brain physiology. That's how natural it's brain physiology is genetically encoded into all of us. And Mm -hmm. We need to understand this core principle of dissatisfaction, no matter what we get, no matter the relationship that we're seeking and we finally get it, the job, the new car, whatever, the moment we get it, very quickly we're going to become dissatisfied again and we're back on the search. What meditation research has shown is those very centers in our brain that are activated in the search are activated in meditation. But interestingly enough, what meditation does is it keeps those centers active. So actually with meditation, we are starting to feel an internal sense of joy and well-being that actually grows with time and becomes independent of achievement. So we're getting a very different outcome through meditation than we are, say, through medication or seeking objects. In meditation, we're actually nourishing an inbuilt built sense of well-being that's always with us. And it becomes independent of outer circumstances and it becomes independent of attaining anything. It's just ours in the moment all day long. That doesn't antidote the seeking into the world desire that we'll still all have as a human being and that no matter what we get on the outer world, it'll quickly re-establish a sense of dissatisfaction. So by meditation, we can access this core of well-being that we carry with us even when we're in the midst of, say, that animal response of dissatisfaction. So we're able to, in a way, rest in a sense of well-being, even while that sense of dissatisfaction we experience as a human being is still going to be in operation. The difference is when we're only chasing some object, whether it's a chemical a behavior or some object or a relationship, we're only feeding that animal of dissatisfaction. In meditation, we're feeding a very different animal. And there's that beautiful Native American saying, perhaps you're familiar with it, which is we all have within us two wolves. One that feeds this sense of dissatisfaction and the other that feeds this core sense of well-being. Our life and how we live it is going to depend on which animal we feed. So I have found that feeding the animal of meditation and this core sense of well-being is going to serve us and myself in the long run much better than only feeding this animal of desire. Uh, in the annals of meditation, there is often a, a quip that is said, which is, meditation, we vow to bring an end to all desires. Well, vowing to bring an end to all desires is another desire in and of itself. So there's a kind of a paradox built into that. What I find in meditation is we can step off the wheel of desire so that we're not caught in it. Right. Just like we're always going to feel negative emotions. We're all going to experience moments of frustration, anger, grief, sadness, pain whether it's acute or chronic, physical or emotional pain, we're all going to experience it to one degree or another. By nourishing this animal of well-being and carrying that with us, what I've discovered is we can then meet these life circumstances we're all going to engage. And I've had tremendous experience, say, with veterans who have chronic physical pain because of the result of their military experience. But as one veteran who came to us said, after doing our program, he said, I don't know what's going on here, 
but I'm getting relief from my chronic pain that I've never had from all the other experiences and interventions I've done. This sense of well-being is helping me meet my chronic pain in such a way that at times it's completely gone, but at other times when it does return, I, I have a skillfulness of meeting it now that I didn't have before, so I feel like I can navigate the pain in ways I couldn't before. And so I think this is why we're having such success both in the air arena of chemical dependency, but also when we come into hospice with end of life issues where people are experiencing you know, loss of their physical attributes, loss of job, loss uh, ultimately of their life. They're discovering a sense of well-being with which they can meet end of life issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that can't be taken away from them. Yeah. No, it's, it's incredible when we discover an inner resource that no experience, no person can take from us. Mm -hmm. And I've met people who've been in unbelievably adverse experiences who are able to overcome them and discover this sense of well-being within themselves and bring an end to the pain and the suffering that they've experienced for decades and go on to lead a life they could never have imagined leading and now doing it in such a way that they're not only bringing an end to their own suffering but feeling the sense of well-being but also being able to bring that and convey it to the people around them. Mm -hmm. I would like you to just highlight a few things for someone who's wanting to go into recovery or just in, just new in recovery. Uh, number one, maybe you could just say what that means to you. What does recovery mean to you? But mm -hmm. what, what are some really important next steps or principles for them to be thinking about? Yeah. You know, when I think of the question, what is recovery? I think of recovery as we've discovered or rediscovered an inner sense of core well-being that we can carry with us no matter our circumstances that we're facing. Recovery to me is a lifelong process because we're all constantly being assaulted by different life experiences. Also experiences that we might have encountered early in our life these will continue to bubble up from our unconscious. We may face some of them, but I, I think of our experiences that we have kind of like one of those children's Pez machines, candy machines. You, you take a Pez out and the next one comes up. So in recovery, while we're facing and getting skills that we can use for the rest of our life to deal with our emotions, our previous experiences, as we deal with one, the next one will, will come and emerge out of our unconscious. But now we've got the skills, the life skills with which to meet emerging material, as well as to meet material that we're experiencing day to day in our, in our life for the rest of our life. So recovery for me really means recovering this sense of well-being and recovering and having in place the skills so now we can say, I know what to do. For me, it's the person who doesn't know what to do who's in trouble. But when we know we possess skillfulness with which to meet any moment that comes into our life, now we are developing a sense of inner resource and inner skillfulness and inner resiliency. We know we can navigate life. So those are core principles to me that have to do with recovery. It's not achieving some transcendent state uh, that we're above everything. I think that there is a core within us that can feel in a way that we're above everything, but that we're now able to meet every life circumstance from within the circumstance. So it's a kind of an interesting paradox recovery we're feeling something that's always available to us that can help us meet the moment, but it's not removing us from the moment. It's actually helping us get more in touch with the moment, feel our, our emotions, 
feel our body sensations and yet navigate them. So recovery to me is a lifelong process, but it is having those skills deeply embedded and in place and, and that we're no longer having to think about them. Early in recovery, yes, we're having to go over them and over them, over them. I think it's important when we're going through recovery that we're in, in a community that is helping us nourish those skills. So we're, in, we're with like-minded people who've both known how to bring them into place. So they've gone through the process and can help uh, support us through the process. So community is really important, but we're also having the, say the materials, reading materials, MP3s that we're listening to while we're on our own. Right. So I've, I've always told people, I think that there are three pieces to recovery that are in very important. One that we're going to have to do ourselves. We're going to have to face ourselves. We're going to have to look in the mirror and meet ourselves and learn how to meet ourselves without judgment, without criticism. So I say in a way, we're falling in love with the person we see in the mirror and the person that we're seeing in the mirror is actually falling in love with ourselves. So we're, we're able to meet ourselves and remove all sense of judgment and self judgment. In a way, it's the quality of forgiveness that we have towards ourselves and for any actions that we may have engaged in life. So that's the first piece. The second piece, I think we need to find another that we can meet with on a regular basis who's a mentor, who's been through the process that we're engaging and we know that they've been through it. So we know that they can access that within ourself that we're trying to find and we can trust them. And this is what I discovered early on. I found several mentors who I trusted inherently and who really helped me and encouraged me every step of the way and that I could meet with them privately. And I think the beauty now is we can meet by Skype, we can meet by phone, and we can meet in person. So many mentors are actually states away, but we're, we're able to call them and, 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 and meet them wherever we are and however we are. So I, I think that's the second part. The third part is I think we need a group. When we're in a group, the group accesses elements about ourselves that, that don't come out when we're with an individual or when we're with our, by ourselves. We are social animals. So part of our healing is going to take place in a social environment with a group of people. And again, by surrounding ourselves with like-minded people who've been through or are going through the experience that we are, we have a sense of community or our tribe. This was very important to me and it, and it took me years to what I would call find my tribe. Mm -hmm. And now I feel fortunate I, I've been able to find people who I feel are part of my tribe in the community where I'm living but also spread out around the world. So no matter now where I am in the world, I can find a person that feels they're part of my tribe. And I can do that both in person, whether I'm in England, Australia, Germany, Italy, uh, eventually I'm coming into China, I'll know I'll find people there, Japan, but I can also meet them through Skype and through a phone call. So resources are simply a phone call away, a meeting away. So I know that recovery really is based on these basic core elements, having a group, having the ability to meet with a mentor and being able to face ourselves in the mirror. And I actually ask my students, go to the hardware store, buy a full length mirror, put it in your room, sit in front of it, and actually meet yourself in that mirror and have the person in the mirror meet you until you can eventually heal all sense of self-criticism, uh, self-judgment, and the person in front of you is really loving you and you're loving the person in front of you. And, and realistically, that can take years. But I, by, by having these different skill sets, I think we can find this ability to heal completely. 
Yeah, that strikes me as a very difficult practice. A lot of people would have trouble with that. It is, and, and actually it was the first practice that my mentor gave me. She said, go to the hardware store, get a mirror, because I was full of self-judgments mm -hmm. in the family that I had learned, grown in. Uh, anger wasn't something we did. It was repressed. In the culture I grew up in, emotions were repressed. And we were taught to be inauthentic in certain manners. Mm -hmm. She had me face myself in that mirror day after day after day. And for three years, basically, I looked in that mirror almost every day for 20 minutes wow. and rediscovered a deep sense of healing. At the same time, I was meeting with my mentor individually. Right. And I was finding groups that I could uh, also meet in on a regular basis, weekly or monthly, and, and really learn how to be an authentic human being and face, in a way, my worst nightmares. Right. And I remember actually the moment where everything fell into place, and it was, I was driving to one of these group meetings, and I realized there was something that was bubbling up within me, a core kind of wound within myself and I realized if not now when mm -hmm. if not with this group then who and if not me not somebody else and I realized today's the day I bring an end to being inauthentic to hiding and I think everybody who's in recovery for whatever they're recovering from is learning how to come out of hiding and to face the wounds, face themselves, and learning how to be authentic with whomever they're with, but learning it in a skillful way so that whatever we're saying and however we're saying it, it's said in a certain way with love and kindness, without judgment, whether it's self-judgment or judgment towards the other. Because I've come to realize a, a very core principle within myself and the people I work with, which is, we're all doing the best we know how. Each moment, we're all a sum of our conditioning and the experience we've lived through. So we're all doing the best we know how. And, and that helps, for me, remove a sense of judgment towards another or towards myself. Now, in any given moment, I can do better than the moment before because I have new learning. But I'm still, as is everyone around me, doing the best we know how. So I find that relieved me from judging myself and judging others. And now I'm just trying to see what's the best response I can have in this moment that feels very skillful and comes from a sense of authenticity and feeling in connection with myself and in connection with the person or the world around me. So I do feel we all have within us a perfect response to each moment. We're just learning how to access it in better and better and more skillful ways. And this is why I think recovery is a lifelong process. We're always learning new and better ways of meeting the moment. We're always stepping out of our conditioning and meeting the moment with unique responses. And we're just learning how to be less and less reactive and more and more responsive kind and be a better loving human being isolation is such a key element of addiction and we're not only isolated i love the way you brought those three elements in because we're isolated from other people we don't trust other people and we often don't have anyone who's ever mentored us or tried to help us to become a more mature functional human being and we're isolated from ourselves. We don't see ourselves either. So this works on all of those levels. It's lovely. Yeah, on each of those levels you just mentioned, we have to bring out each one a step at a time. Mm -hmm. But each of those levels, I think, is, in, is incredibly important to a, a, to a full healing. And, and that we don't have a... a a kind of a, I'll say it this way, a childish view of healing. Healing takes time and it's a lifetime endeavor. Mm -hmm. And to pretend otherwise, I think, gets us into trouble. I, I love the notion that 
I hope for the rest of my days, I will always have within myself a little element of doubt. It keeps me humble. It keeps me learning. It keeps me innocent. And it keeps me asking the question, what else do I need to learn here? I may know incredible things and feel the ability to carry a deep sense of resiliency and skillful means for meeting the moment. But I know that I can always learn new things and always have new insights about myself. So the person that I'm in front of, whether I'm facing myself in the mirror or I'm sitting here with you, is a part of me is like wanting to learn. What do you have to teach me? Uh, it's not just what do I have to offer, but I'm looking for what can I discover that you have, that you've learned, that can be instrumental in me growing myself into the world. So we're in a constant developmental phase, I think, as human beings. We're, we're never going to be perfected. We're always in the, in the movement of growth and, and growing perfection. Well, and the, the courage and the, the possibility of that is what what's necessary for that to happen otherwise we're in that closed down really suffering there's so much suffering in that and then when something whatever it is for somebody when they can move forward into that authenticity that's the real root of of recovery and you mentioned a word that's very important to me curiosity if we can nourish a deep sense of curiosity Mm -hmm. That's going to go a long way towards helping us move into that connection with ourself and the people around us where mm -hmm. we just become curious. Uh, what do you know that I don't? And I've been fascinated. I've been on trains in different parts of the world. And I've always been struck when I'm on a train or I'm on a plane and somebody in their own way turns to me and says something like, what do you know that I don't? And then I'm looking at them and I'm saying, well, what do you know that I don't? And, <laughs> and we're having this incredible moment of meeting where we're not meeting from, I know more than you, but what can I discover? What can I learn? And, and this constant ability to be in a learning, I think is one of the most crucial parts to recovery. We're, we're always willing to be in that learning phase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Richard. This has been wonderful, wonderful conversation. And uh, I know that some people are going to want to get a hold of you. What's your best way through your website? And could you tell us the address and anything else you'd like to share about that? The best way is coming to me through my website. It's www.irest.us. So irest.us. And that's the Integrative Restoration Institute. But that's the best way. And, and if you put in your uh, email, then we can reach out to you. But we have many resources on our website. Uh, and there are a number of free downloads, how to have restful sleep, this core principle of how do I access an inner resource of well-being. So on our, re on our website, we have many of these re free resources and then lots of downloads for our program for healing. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Lynn. It's been a delight. And it has. I look forward to learning from you more and more. <laughs> thank you. And me from you. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Go to KillabyCenter.com, Radical Recovery Summit, to see the full schedule of speakers and to register to watch these free online September 23rd and 24th in the Radical Recovery Summit 2017.